All right, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I believe this is part C of the Temple series. So let's read Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now, some people say that this is a uh, like a census. They're paying, you know, a, a tax to, for the privilege of living in the Roman Empire. And what's interesting is that prior to this, that Greece had... Well, the Greeks, specifically Alexander, who's called the Great, uh, had conquered this area previously. And uh, Rome had only recently conquered the area. Matter of fact, uh, the Parthian Empire had also conquered this area just prior to Rome, uh, but they didn't keep it for very long. I believe, if memory serves me correctly, they gave it up as a symbol of peace with the Romans. Uh, Rome and Parthia were pretty much equals. So the Romans uh, pulled some sneaky stuff on the Parthians, but the Parthians kicked their rear, I guess you could say, a few times. And uh, Rome kind of tucked its tail between its legs, and ran off. Uh, they didn't want to fool with the Parthians. You know, so... But Greece, or uh, Alexander, had conquered pretty much that whole area, from Egypt all through uh, the land of Israel, all the way to uh, India, part of India. He conquered a huge, huge area. And uh, maybe that's why the New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew. Because Greek was indeed the common language of business and commerce. And if you wanted to conduct business in Rome, well, then you would know Latin, but... Uh, Europeans consider Americans halfway illiterate because we only know, generally, we only know one language. Most Europeans know at least two, if not three, languages. So, and it was common that uh, for uh, Romans to know Greek and, uh, you know, the the Greeks and the Romans, uh, Rome took a lot of things from Greece as far as uh, culture was concerned. So that is, uh, that's how it was. So that's why I think, uh, I honestly believe that the Greek was the common language and that is what, probably what Christ and the disciples probably spoke. You know, it's like it's like English in the United States. I mean, you know, uh, how many people speak the uh, native Indians' languages? Not many. So, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. So, you know, you went to the city of your birth, I guess, or your residence. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. King David. And David was of the tribe of Judah, which was the tribe of the kings. 
Uh, verse 5, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, if this was December 25th in the middle of winter, would they be out in the field with the flocks? Probably not. It'd be cold. So, do I think uh, this happened on tw December 25th? No, I don't think so. All right, so you got shepherds in the fields watching the flocks at night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Well, all people of faith, I guess you could say, right? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. See, Christ is a title. Uh, it's basically the Greek equivalent to Messiah, the Anointed One. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. Now, you know, um, from the other parts, A, uh, a and B, uh, John the Baptist, people that were in the know paid attention to him. And then, you know, uh, if they had... They probably, you know, you wonder what, what Mary had told everybody. I imagine Mary was probably a very humble individual, and she probably didn't go around bragging about things that she had seen or heard from the angel. But uh, John, they, you know, uh, Zacharias was in the temple, and... Uh, he lost his voice, and then when the child was born, he got his voice back. So, you know, there were probably people paying attention to that child. I wonder what the future holds for that child. Hmm. Yeah, they're going to find out. And when they had seen it, they made known a broad saying which was told them concerning this child. Eh, who's going to listen to a bunch of shepherds in the field? Yeah, they probably had too much to drink and uh, and made up a story about seeing some angels or, you know, eh, whatever. You know, because after all, if, if you know, why didn't God uh, send his angels to the uh, chief priests? You know, the religious people, you know, the, the guys that had the PhDs and... Uh, Torah. Now, God didn't go to them. God didn't go to the Pharisees. God didn't go to the Sadducees. God's angel went to the shepherds in the field. And what was King David before he became king? A shepherd in the field watching his father's flock. Think about that. Verse 18. I'm sorry, 17. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them 
by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that he had heard and seen. And it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Yeshua. Uh, eh, wrong. His name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. That's right, an angel of the Lord named him. And I don't read Yeshua there anywhere. So chew on that, Hebrew roots people, sacred name people. Jesus is the sacred name given by an angel of the Lord to his people. And I have a, I'm positive that the Antichrist is going to be called Yeshua. You watch and see. Mark my words. Oh, glory! Yeshua has come! Well, Matthew 24 says, Believe it not. Now, eight days. Why eight days? Well, eight, the, the number eight was... Uh, some Bible scholars say that it, it signified a new beginning. You know, God created everything on the sixth day, the seventh day he rested, and then the eighth day was a new beginning. And the eighth day circumcision was a sign of the covenant between the Lord and his people, the males, that is. So... All right, verse 22. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now, there was a certain number of days that uh, women were, they would be cleansing their body. That's, you know, purification, they called it. I don't rem I, I hadn't read that in the book of Leviticus in so long. I don't remember what it is, but, uh, you know, after they give birth, there was like a certain amount of time uh, they gave the woman's body time to repair itself. Because, ladies, you know that, it, those of you that have had children, you know that is a one, who, you know, it, yeah, it's a, it's pretty intense for a woman's body, you know. I can only imagine. If uh, some, I've heard people say that if men had to give birth, they'd probably never have sex. But I don't know. All right, uh, verse twenty-three. All right, so they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord: Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. Ah, and he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, they took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy, to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles. Now, in the Greek, the word Gentiles is ethnos. It's the root word where we get the word ethnic group, like Caucasians are an ethnic group. Um, Negroes from Africa are an ethnic group. 
Japanese are an ethnic group. Ethnos. Ethnic group. In the Hebrew, it means nation. Sometimes a heathen nation. Sometimes a non-heathen nation. So, you know, when people tell you that Gentile means non-Jew, they don't know what they're talking about. They have no idea. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It can mean that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. What did he mean by set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel? Well, he's not talking about autumn. Falling down dead and rising again? Death and resurrection? That's how I read it. Maybe you have a better take than I do. I don't know. Uh, what do I know? I'm just some guy that's read the Bible a couple times. That's it. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through my own soul also that the thought of many hearts may be revealed. What sword? Well, let's take a look. Well, what sword? Ephesians 6.17. Now, you know, you could always read uh, the whole chapter, the verses before it and the verses after it, you know, because I get people accuse me of pulling verses out of context. Um, that's why I'm so long-winded on some of this stuff. You know, I, I try to build a solid foundation so that when we arrive at the end of the journey of where I'm trying to, well, the where the I think the Lord's leading, um, people get it. I, I'm 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 hoping that. But in Ephesians six and verse seventeen, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Hebrews. 412. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's right, a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. Oh yeah. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Oh yeah. The word of God cuts asunder the hypocrites. Well, you know, <laughs> Revelation 1.16, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Who's that? Christ. Revelation 2.12, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Verse 16, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Oh, yeah. Revelation 19, 15, and we're going to go back to uh, Luke chapter 2 in a second. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. Ethnos. Ethnos. It's the same word. Gentiles and nations. Same word. Um... And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Yeah, Christ isn't going to tickle them with a feather. He's going to 
smack them in the head with a rod of iron if they deserve it. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Back to Luke chapter 2. Verse 34, And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, that this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through mine, uh, through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Didn't we just read that? Oh, yeah. And there was one, Anna, a prophetess. Ah, you know, there's a, there was a few female prophets in the Bible. Let me tell you something, people. If God can't find a man to be worthy to be a prophet, he'll pick a woman. He'll do it. He'll do it. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about four score and four years. Uh, she was a widow for 84 years. So this woman had to be close to 90s, late 90s. You know, she was up there in age. Whew. Um, you know, unless she got married at like 12 or something, you know. She was probably close to 100 years old, between 95 and 100. Um, and she was a widow about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. Boy, I tell you what, I, that's what you call a prayer warrior. Fasting and prayers night and day. Oh, boy. And she come in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, 12 years old, keep that in mind, people. That's basically a, a sixth grader, maybe seventh. Um, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. And they, supposing him to have been in, their, in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. All right, so here it is, the, uh, you know, Feast of Passover. Uh, they kept the Passover, and then they're returning back home. And evidently, there's, you know, they've got family and friends. And, you know, traveling back in them days, you had what was called highwaymen or robbers. So you would go with a group. So... You know, you uh, it wouldn't be unusual for, you know, a large number of people. You know, there might have been two, three hundred people in this caravan. So, you know, they didn't really notice, you know, Jesus wasn't with them. So then they returned back to Jerusalem and they're looking for Christ, right? Um. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, three days, right? How many days was, did Jesus say that uh, he'd be in the heart of the earth? Three days, right? 
Jonah was in the whale's belly for how long? Three days, right? And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors. Uh, these are doctors of the law. These are the, the PhDs. These are, these are not medical doctors. These are, you know, people that have gone to, I guess, uh, Bible college for eight years, eight or nine years. It's eight or nine years. Uh, four years as a bachelor's, six years as a master's, and then eight years is a, a doctorate, and I think nine years is a uh, doctor of divinity. So you're talking to somebody that spent a considerable amount of time in studying the Word of God. But, you know, some of these people uh, studied uh, the opinions of rabbis so so here it is he's sitting in the midst of the doctors both hearing them and asking them questions now that's a thing when Jesus asks you when Jesus asked a question <laughs> he uh, he was he wasn't asking you something because he didn't know it. No, 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 no. That's not how it worked. He wasn't saying, oh, hey, uh, I don't know the answer to this question. Can you help me? No. No, he was asking you a question to make you think. I remember I had, uh, I was taking electronics in college. Well, vocational school. And I had a teacher. I really liked him. You'd ask him a question. He'd ask you a question. And by the time you answered his question, you, were answer, you answered your own question. He was really good at that. I, you know, I didn't like him at first, but once I understood his teaching style, you know, he'd always ask the right question. And by the time you answered his question, your question was done. You, you understood. So, Jesus is 12 years old, talking to people that are probably in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who were, had doctorate degrees in the Bible. What kind of questions did, they, uh, did he ask when he was, you know, an adult? Well, what kind of questions did uh, Jesus ask? Well, let's take a look when he was an adult in his ministry in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. So in other words, they're going to try to trick him and have him break Roman law by the things that he says. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians. Herod. Herod, according to Josephus, was an Edomite of Esau. God hated Esau. Read Malachi chapter 1. God does not like Esau and the Edomites. They, he married a Hittite, two Hittite women and a daughter of Ishmael which I think are the Saudi Arabians, but, you know, the royal family. So here it is, the Pharisees are teaming up with the, the Herod, you know, the Herod family that uh, killed all the children in Bethlehem trying to kill Jesus. Yeah, that family. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar, or not? 
Huh. Verse 18. What did Jesus say? But Jesus, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Jesus asked a question. Yeah, you bunch of hypocrites trying to trick me, huh? Well, that's the Bob translation. Verse 19. Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. Now, a penny back in those days, uh, don't, don't think about a, like a penny today, okay? A penny in those days was a day's wage for an unskilled laborer, a day's wage. So a penny was, you know, it wasn't super valuable, but, you know, if you were an unskilled laborer and you worked all day, that's about what you would get paid, a penny. Uh, and by the way, when I was a kid, uh, a penny would buy three good-sized Tootsie Rolls. What's a penny buy today? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We used to have penny candy back in the days. God, I must be old, huh? God help us, I must be old. Show me the tribute money, and they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, so here it is, he's asking another question. Whose is this image and superscription? In other words, whose picture is on this coin and whose writing is on here? They said unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Oh yeah. When Jesus asks you a question, you're <laughs> you're yeah, he's gonna make you think. And if you're trying to be a hypocrite, he's gonna he's gonna make you into a a fool. Matter of fact, uh you've probably heard me say this before, but uh I went to business college and I took business law. And my instructor was actually an attorney. And I think it was a he. He or she, I don't remember anymore. I've had so many teachers. But I remember, I remember this. Uh, said, you know, a good prosecuting attorney or a defense attorney will never ask a witness a question that they do not already know the answer to. You see, they're trying to catch you in a lie. So, that's why you never ask, you know, a, a witness can make an attorney look like a fool when they ask a question that they don't know already know the answer to. So, so let's have another question. Verse 22, when they, the Pharisees, when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him. Now the Sadducees were the ones that, uh, they did the temple sacrifices. They were the ones that burned the animals. And they only recognized the Torah, which was the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Leviticus was their specialty. They knew Leviticus inside and out, uh, which was the temple priests. Um, but they didn't accept Isaiah. They didn't accept Jeremiah. They didn't accept uh, the book of Kings or Chronicles or the Psalms. Uh, they didn't accept any of those books. You know, they, so here it is. Well, so this is, uh, the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him. Now, if there's no resurrection and you die, what good is your religion? If the, you have no hope. That's why they were sad, you see. Yeah, they were the Sadducees. Saying, Master, 
Master, Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. So she had all seven brothers as uh, husbands and never had any children. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err. That's where you get the word error. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given a marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. In heaven, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now there's a lot of people that will run around and say, see, see, this proves that the sons of God in Genesis 6, that they, it's not, those are not angels, the sons of God. No, 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 because angels can't have sex. See, that's proof. But it says, but are as the angels of God, but they leave out those two last words, but are as the angels of God in heaven. You see, not all the angels of God are in heaven. Some of them were kicked out. Oh, yeah. So, that's right. So they want you to think, you know, they're, they're really good at their deception. They really are, these devils. But, you know, they can only get away with this stuff because people are lazy. And they don't read their Bibles. You know, I, I mean, I'm no, I'm no Bible scholar. I'm just, I've just read the Bible a few times. And the Lord's given me a fairly decent memory, you know but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, here comes the question, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? See, when Jesus asks a question, he knows the answer. And he's going to prove you wrong if you're, if you're in the wrong. So what kind of questions was 12-year-old Jesus asking the doctors of the law? Huh? Good question, huh? I bet you they were, you know, when they would teach something that was wrong, Jesus wouldn't probably jump up and down and go, you're wrong. No. He'd say, well, if that's true, what about where the scripture says this? You know, Jesus would make you think and point out where you were in error. Now, how do you think those doctors of the law, when they were probably being corrected by a 12-year-old kid that, you know, is not this the carpenter's son? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is the carpenter's son. Where's this guy getting all this stuff, you know? All right, let's go back to Luke chapter 2. All right, Luke chapter 2, verse... 45. And when they, his parents, uh, when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, 
Why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Ah, uh, he's asking another question. Don't you know I got to be about my father's business? And they're not, he's not talking about Joseph either. So, wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And of course, he's talking about the heavenly father, right? Verse 50. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And we're going to be getting to the good part. So the temple was basically considered God's house. Matter of fact, have you ever heard of Bethel? Beth is Hebrew for house. El has reference to God. So Bethel basically means house of God or God's house. Oh, one more, one thing, everybody. Uh, there was a guy named Robert Pickle. He had a site called the Noahide News where he reported on the Noahide laws. And he's got a lot of good information. I Somebody told me he recently died, which I, I just wrote the guy uh, just, I guess it was months ago, but uh, I guess he recently died. And um, I had spoken to him on the phone at least once that I remember. And uh, he had a lot of information um, as relating to the Noahide laws and things going on. Well, his website was taken down. I don't know if the family did it or if he didn't, they didn't pay the bill or for whatever reason, the website's gone. Well, it's still in the Google cache um, so it must have been fairly recent because Google's cache is usually three to four weeks. So what I did was I copied all the information and I put it on my blog. Um, so in the comments, I'm going to put a link to it. You could take a look. He was a prolific writer. I mean, unbelievable amount of writing that he did and uh, basically in a nutshell all your TV preachers all your churches pretty much they're all going to fall for the Noahide laws you watch they will and uh, they're when the when the Noahide Messiah comes they're going to worship him. You watch, everybody, especially all these pre-trib rapture people. When they find out that they, uh, they're they not out of here when things get bad and they're going to have to suffer and possibly die for their faith and uh, give up their uh, city life, uh-uh, they're going to end up denying Christ. You watch. You know, it's amazing. The Baptists uh, condemn the charismatic teachers and the wealth and prosperity people, you know, like Kenneth Copeland and that bunch. But they're not much, they're not that much different, really. You know, I mean, let's face it, 10 out of 12 apostles died for their faith. Stephen died for his faith. Almost every prophet died for their faith. Christ died for us. And he promises that we would have trouble, tribulation, and persecution in this life. He promised that. And 
they don't think they're going to have to suffer for the faith. In the last hundred years, some estimated between 50 and 100 million Christians died for their faith in various countries, most notably Russia and Ukraine. I don't know. Uh, you know, but uh, you could take a look at it and uh, see what you think. I don't agree with everything that he wrote, but I'll tell you what. He was on the money on a lot of things. And I am pray that he's with the Lord now. I'm pretty sure he is. And uh, he's not going to end up seeing what's what's coming. So, I don't know why the Lord had me live in a time such as this. But uh, this is the time he chose for me to live. Gave me the education that he gave me. And uh, I'm going to do what I can. I guess warn the flock as long as I'm on the tube. Like I said, when the tube deletes me off, that's it. I'm done with uh, internet ministry. And like I said, anybody wants uh, copies of all my work, just send me a USB drive or, or an SD card. If you're... If you're outside the United States, an SD card would be the best. 64 gig, uh, gig uh, or a USB. And the reason I say that is because I could send a USB, I mean, I can send an SD card in a letter, and I don't have to fill out a customs form for an SD card. If it fits in the letter, you don't have to fill out a customs form, which means I don't have to go to the... Um, stand in line at the post office and socially distance myself. But uh, a USB drive I can stick in the mail if it's uh, domestic U.S. So, all right, we'll hit the uh, comments section. And um, you can see uh, his, read his work. And I've got a few things on the uh, the blog also. It's called Mystery Babylon. Where or who is Mystery Babylon? Oh yeah. Did a couple Bible studies on that. All right. All blessings, praise, a glory and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.